There's a story by an unknown author that made the rounds through emails and web postings um, a decade or so ago. I didn't think it was that long ago until I looked it up. I was like, oh, wow, and I was trying to find a story. Uh, and it's called, um, You'll Find Jesus There. And it goes like this. You might remember it. Tomorrow morning, I'll open up your heart, the surgeon said to the eight-year-old boy. You'll find Jesus there, the boy said. The surgeon continued, I'll open your heart and check the damage. You'll find Jesus there, the boy said. When I see the damage, I will suture you back up and then think about the next step, said the surgeon. You will find Jesus in my heart because my Sunday school teacher told me so. She said, it says so in the Bible. Besides that, our Sunday school songs say he lives there, said the boy. The surgery took place the next day. After the surgery, the surgeon began to make notes of what he found. In his mind, there was no hope and no cure. The little boy would die within a matter of months. The thought began to get to the doctor, and all of a sudden the doctor shouted to God, Why did you do this to the boy? Why can't he live a normal life? And God spoke to the surgeon's heart and said, The boy is a part of my flock and will always be a part of my flock. When he is with me, there will be no more suffering and pain. He will have comfort and peace. One day his parents, as well as you, will join him and my flock will continue to grow. The next day, the surgeon went to the boy's room and sat down with the parents beside the bed. In a moment or two, the boy opened his eyes and asked very quietly, What did you find in my heart? With tears flowing down his cheeks, the surgeon said, I found Jesus there. We often operate under two assumptions in our lives. First, that we can somehow change or control who God is. And second, that we can somehow control or change or overcome our environments on our own, by ourselves. Like this short story about a boy and his surgeon, we are confronted with the inaccuracies of these assumptions with our gospel text today. And it is a bizarre and tough story, isn't it? There's so much in this text. What makes it even more bizarre is that in my research I found out that in the Catholic le lectionary, this is the Thanksgiving text every year. This, if you follow the Catholic le lectionary every Sunday before Thanksgiving, you read about the garrison demoniac. That's pretty bizarre, isn't it? But anyway, Jesus comes across this man in his travels. And this happens, this happens immediately, we skipped over this story in our narrative lectionary series, but this happens immediately after Jesus is in the boat and a storm comes and they come and they wake him up and Jesus is able to calm the storm. He can control the natural world, make something so chaotic natural and calm. And so after that, they land and Jesus comes across this man and he recognizes that he has an unclean spirit about him and he casts it out in such an epic way, right? To throw the spirit into 2,000 swine that just happened to be around and then they just run and jump off a cliff into the water and drown. Interesting, right? It's so epic. It's like it's made for a movie or something. And there's, there's so much that happens here. But I think, at least for me, I think that we often get caught up on this idea and the ideas of demon possession, right? When we hear this story, demon possession, a demoniac, and an exorcism. I mean, I guess that's what you'd call what Jesus performs, right? So how do we as modern listeners, how do we deal with that? How do we talk about demons in our lives? Any answers to that? Demons in your what? Demons in your mind. Things you don't forgive yourself for? Hmm? Prayer? Prayer? I mean, I like watching bad horror movies. It's a little confession. 
I love bad horror movies. Tara's like, why are you watch this? I don't know. They're fantastic. And those demons are, you know, the actual embodiment manifestation of evil, right? I don't think most of us encounter demons that way in our daily life. But mental health, addiction, anxiety, depression, isolation, greed, self-doubt. That's how we interact with demons in our lives. There are many demons. And many of us have moments where we are under the control of these demons. Which makes me wonder, how, how do we treat or approach those people who are mentally ill? Who are in the throes of addiction? Who are depressed? Have we moved much further in compassion than the Gerasenes? I mean, how is this man when Jesus approaches him? He has been bound outside of the community. They keep chaining him, but he keeps breaking out of the chain, so they chain him even tighter and harder and heavier. Have we moved much further past that form of compassion for those who are under demonic possession? Those who are dealing with with mental illness? How are the mentally ill treated today? More and more prisons have become our mental health facilities. This community knows that very well, right? This man was chained in the tombs because of his possession. How many of those in our prison system are suffering from mental illness? Well, the U.S. Department of Justice reports that the majority, the vast majority of prisoners have either abused drugs and or are mentally ill. In self-reporting, they admit to this. So I feel like maybe our compassion hasn't grown that much. And there's something for us to hear in this text there. In our gospel text, the man is only defined by his illness. He's not given a name. We know him as what? Yeah, the demoniac. David Luce writes, Don't we also tend to define ourselves in terms of our deficiencies and setbacks? our disappointments, our failures. Not always, of course, but enough to rob us of the abundant life God hopes that we experience and share. Why is it that every time we want to take a risk and in this way be vulnerable, we are reminded of every failure, every disappointment we've experienced before? Maybe you've experienced this, right? Right before you go to bed and you recap the day or the week. What's the thing that plays back in your head? Yeah, the worst parts. Perhaps because we've allowed these things to possess us too. We too are legion. There are so many voices trying to possess and discourage us that we might still call them legion. Yet against all of them stands the still, small, but mighty voice of the one who still crosses oceans and boundaries, the one who calms the storms of the seas to tell us of God's love and call us back to our right minds and grace-filled identities. And thanks be to God that we are still called. Jesus confronts the illness of this man and casts it out. He meets what is considered impure, and instead of it changing him, he abolishes it. The purity laws exist for a reason so that the impure won't defile us, right? You're told when you go into high school to be careful about which friends you pick, right? Because they're going to influence you. Our environment affects us, not Jesus. He goes into the environment and brings the divine there. There's an awful lot that can be unpacked about the military language that is used in this text. And if you want to know more about that, I recommend that you look up and listen to the Pulpit Fiction Narrative Lectionary podcast because they go into the military language that's used in this text. I've um, been dealing with the herd of swine, the name Legion, all this stuff. But that's, that could be its own 30 minute to an hour. <laughs> it is. Their podcast is like 40 some minutes on it. Uh, but it's really interesting if you want to get into that. But Jesus, in this text, Jesus is who he is. 
And he confronts the ills in us and he brings about wholeness. Not just the ills in the man, but the ills in the community that was treating him that way. And he attempts to bring about a wholeness. So how do we respond? The man who is made clean, who is now in his right mind, as the text puts it, he comes and he begs. He begs Jesus to allow him to follow him. Let him be a disciple. Let him come and learn from him. And Jesus tells him, no. That man has just been made free. He is bound to no one. He doesn't need to be bound to following Jesus now. Instead, he's given a task in his freedom to go and share his story. Would we have the courage to share our stories of encountering the divine? Would we have the courage? We want to go and follow Jesus. We want him to tell us what to do, but do we have the courage to go and do it? This man is made whole and set free and goes and shares this good news. Or would we be more like the community? Jesus is trying to heal this community as well. And they witness or they hear about this wonderful thing that has happened, this man that has been set free and put in right mind and brought back into the community. And what is their response? They beg Jesus for him to leave. Why? Fred Craddock writes on this text. He says that in the case of the garrison demoniac, the people knew the locus of the evil. They knew where the man lived. And they devoted considerable time and expense trying to guard and to control him. A community thus learns to live with the demonic forces, isolating and partially controlling them. If it's not spiritualizing the story too much to say so, this partially successful balance of tolerance and management of the demonic among them also allowed the people to keep attention off their own lives. But now, but now the power of God for good comes to their community and it disturbs a way of life that they had come to accept. Isn't there a phrase about that? Rather learn, you'd rather live with the devil you know? David Luce notes, Odd as it may sound, we often prefer the devil we know to the freedom we do not. Congregations, us. We too can take a false sense of security from the dysfunctions that they have learned to cope with, and they fear what change, even change for health, may bring. Communal identity is in the sense more difficult to change than individual identity, as we see in this text. Indeed, if Mark's depiction of Jesus' ministry is any indication, affecting change among a fearful community can be even more difficult than stilling storms or casting out demons. I mean, Jesus did those two things. And yet when he tries to bring change and wholeness to the community, they tell him to leave. Or well, those two assumptions that we operate in our life, that we can somehow change or control God, or that we alone can somehow change, control, or, change, or, or move out of our current environment. Well, in our story today, we see that Jesus is who he is. He heals who he heals. He restores who needs restored, and he sees when he won't be effective. We cannot change who God is, but God does show up to offer us and our community hope and healing. We can't affect this change on our own, but we need to be willing to let the divine show us new ways of healing and wholeness. So when our church asks for us to serve as an elder in the diaconate or on the board to do the work of making sure God's ministry can function and flourish here, will we serve? Oh, we're glad for those who are willing to do so. Willing to grow in the divine and share God in new ways. And when our community needs beds and linens, God calls for us to give so that that need can be met. These, 
these are the stories we can go and tell. The hope that we can give for people to find Jesus there, to find Jesus here, to be welcomed into community, a community centered not on any one person or one idea, but God. A place where none are defined by their worst days or their worst desires, but where God's presence lives in our lives, guides us, and frees us. We are more than our demons. So much more. We are children of God. So we should live like it. We should have the courage to go and share the good news, the stories of where we encounter the divine. Part of doing that is through our service. Through service in, in Food for Home and Matt 1128 and so much more, but also in the service to the business of the church. We need to get the business done to be able to do all the ministries that we do. And so every year around this time, we commission those. We give them a holy call to the service that they are about to do um, in the name of Jesus in this place. And so for everybody who will be uh, serving on the board this next year, who's an officer, so that would be like any of the chairs of the committees, uh, the elders, the diaconate, which is the, the, the deaconesses and the deacons, um, and our board chairs. Would you please stand up? You know what? We all love your faces so much. Why don't you come on up front and we'll do it up here. Is that good? Why don't you come up and look out that way, and I'll go out there and look out this way. I should have told you to bring your paper, too, if you didn't. It might be on. Are the words going to be on the screen for this, Chrissy? Nope. Okay, share your papers if you got them. Do we, have, do we need to share some? Does anyone have an extra one we can share over here? Yeah. Look at this. Look at all these volunteers back here. Okay, this will work. Thank you. I didn't tell you this, and this originally we don't, we normally don't come up here, but why not? So let us remember the model of leadership provided by our Lord who came not to be served, but to serve. And who said to his disciples, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave to all. Let us remember the unity that God has given us, one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and creator for all, over all, through all, and in all. Let us remember the church we are chosen to serve using the gifts with which we are equipped for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Let us remember the commission the head of the church gave his followers to go into all the world, witnessing, making disciples, baptizing, teaching, and serving, and realize that charge is intended for those who would lead the church. Do you now gladly, and I want to emphasize gladly, accept the particular office to which you have been elected, and do you promise to fulfill its duties? Let us pray. God, we thank you for those who have accepted these special servant roles in a particular part of your church. We see gifts in them that can be put to good use in building up the body of Christ and in the ministry of reconciliation. 
preserve the resolve each of these servants has at this moment. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the body of which we are members. Amen. I declare that you are now installed to your respective offices in the church. May the Lord provide grace for the service you have resolved to perform. And let us also thank you to all the people who have stepped down who have served previously as well. So thank you and thank you all.